So the second ranking guy got up and he said, all right, uh, we were interrupted, John, and let's start our service again. So we start singing the Star, the Star Spangled Banner again. The guards come in with the machine guns, they take the leadership out, they put them in the torture rooms. Next guy gets up and says, we were interrupted, let's start our service again. Other guards come in and they take, this goes level after level after level. Nobody backed down. Because God got us through everything and nobody was going to deserve God at this time. They finally filled up all the torture rooms and we were able to finish our service. The next day, Ed McEnbyer, who's from Ohio, by the way, uh, down in Dayton, uh, outside of Dayton on the east side, uh, Ed McEnbyer uh, is called in for interrogation by the camp, camp commander. I happen to be monitoring this interrogation on the ground. You can listen on the ground. <clears throat> you can hear people talking in the next building over. So it was my turn to monitor. So I'm monitoring this conversation. So I hear the camp commander says to Ed, says, you know, we're going to torture and kill you if you keep up this church service until you're all dead. You know, we're not going to put up with this. It's a rule of silence. It's a disgrace for us. You know, I'm not going to have this in my camp. So uh, Meckenbeyer says to him, says, you can do whatever you want to us, but as long as one of us is alive, we're having that church service. And he spoke it so calm and so steady, and the camp commander knew what, what he was saying, knew that we weren't kidding. And uh, they let us have that church service the last year and a half. They weren't willing to kill us. There was only one in seven left alive, and they weren't willing. We were a bargaining chip for them. They weren't willing to kill us. But we had that church service the last year and a half of the time that we were up there. And notice everybody was there. Everybody supported this. It wasn't just me, okay, that had this tremendous religious experience. The greatest thing in my life ever happened to me was prisoner of war camp because I understood you know, from that that God is totally in charge, totally powerful, infinitely strong. Believe me, God runs every detail. He, you know, allows evil to happen. God allows evil to happen. Okay? The devil can't do anything unless God allows it. God's in charge. The devil's not up here with God. There's God. Period. End of story. Then there's the angels. You know, the good and bad angels created by God and us. You know, we're all out here. We're preachers. You know, like pigs and animals and stuff like that. That's what we all are compared to God. That's what the devils are compared to God. Like pigs compared to God. There's only one God. Okay. So I found out up there. Had great peace, joy up there because I knew God was in charge. He shows you very well when you have no money, no pleasure, no power. Who's in charge? I understood he was in charge. It's the great, greatest thing that ever happened to me. Okay, that's what I wanted to go through tonight. Stories of a number of uh, good uh, experiences of people that I saw up there trying to give you an idea that there's great love of war and this great um, com companionship and uh, whatever you want to call it, comradeship, friendship among soldiers, among people that fight, the same thing among, um, you'll see the same thing among your friends, uh, you know, when you do something together, when you work together, there becomes a great bond between you, a great friendship be between you, and it should be the same thing between you and your wives and your family, you have a great bond and friendship, raising up kids is a lifelong tough game. And it's uh, something that uh, will bring you extremely close to your wife. And that's the real fight in life, is to have good families on this earth, because then the country's great, the church is great. So it's up to each of you guys to have a really good family, really solid family. That's what your primary responsibility is. Nothing else matters. Your career is just a joke. That's just to get money to support your wife and kids. Anything is your wife and kids. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Um, could you tell us the stories behind the two highest medals that were awarded to you? Okay, the, my medals. Okay. Uh, the first one was uh, a rescue of a, uh, it was a special forces camp that was right on the border with Laos. The North Vietnamese were, uh, were coming into it. The special forces camp was down in the valley. The North Vietnamese were on the mountains around the special forces camp. And they set up their artillery pieces there so they could fire down directly on the Special Forces camp. The Special Forces camp was 10 Americans and about 200 mountain yards. Mountain yards were uh, people that lived back in the jungle mountains. And in this valley, they raised uh, their crops. Uh, they were very uh, poor by our standards. They had uh, huts that they'd make out of bamboo and so on, dirt floors. and. Uh, they would be, uh, the, the, the Special Forces camp tried to train them in being soldiers so that the North Vietnamese wouldn't uh, 
take away their valley from them, which is what they were trying to do, is constantly kill these villages, take the valleys from them. So at any rate, the North Vietnamese were on these uh, uh, mountains around here firing down, and the, the special forces camp would, would be sending out patrols, like every military unit does, when we send out patrols, because you have to know what's happening around you. And the only way you know that in the jungle is by constant patrol. But when they sent out these patrols, they started being ambushed by this North Vietnamese unit. It was a North Vietnamese uh, regiment, uh, 580 or 600 men, something like that. And so totally out, and they were regular troops, they totally outclassed these units down here. So they were, uh, they ambushed these patrols and they kept forcing the patrols back in. Finally, the patrols couldn't even go out from the special forces camp. And this happened over a period of a couple of weeks. They asked us for help. You know, we were uh, down the, the river, down this mountain river about, uh, say, uh, 30 miles or so, something like that. And uh, the weather was so bad, it was a monsoon season, the weather was so bad you couldn't uh, get up to it. I tried a number of times to go up the river, and, uh, you know, the fog was, the fog and the, the, the clouds were right down on it. I finally have to break out, you know, do a, a, a turn right in the water and follow the river back down. And, Anyway, to make a long story short, I hadn't been able to get up there for, for quite a while. But after two weeks, one time I went up that river and the clouds didn't come down to the water. And I just, like a tunnel, following that river through the mountains, I was able to get up to that valley where that special forces camp was. And in the valley, there was a hole. There was a hole going up to about 10,000 feet, which is, which is high enough for fighters to maneuver in. So this valley was clear. The valley was clear. So I came in and I contacted the special forces guys who, who had been just uh, in anguish, literally talking to us on the radio, saying, you guys got to get up there. They're pushing it. They're, they're closing on it. We can't even get outside the patrols. We're hunkering in the bunkers. They got direct fire on us with 105 millimeter, 106 millimeter recoilless. They got, it's just, it's hopeless. We've got to, we've got to blast them out of here. We got no chance otherwise. You've got to get up here. So we, but finally, you know, but we, we weren't able to get up there. Finally, we were able to get up there. So at any rate, you know, I got the, uh, I got in control of the uh, commander, uh, contact with the guy, and I said, okay, I met you, I met your location, and I got enough uh, room here to, I got enough uh, room to bring in fighters, but I got to know where the guys are. So he told me, he says, you got maps? I said, yeah, I got one of fifty, one of fifty thousand scale maps. So he t he tried to tell me where they were. So I looked on the mountain ridge line where he's telling me, and I can't see anything. That they're not there. Okay, I can't see. I says, where is that? What, you know, where, what, what location is that? You know, how do you know that's the location? He says, well, that's the best we can tell from here. And so, of course, he's down on the ground. He says, I know where it is, but I can't, I can't, I'm not sure which ridge line it is or, you know, where it exactly it is. So I said, well, okay, then I'm, I've got to come down here and you're going to have to point it out to me because i got to know where they are or I can't hit them, you know. So he said, oh, you can't land here. They're under, they got the strip under direct fire and they got, you know, you, you, the picture plane and everything like that. I says, I got, I got no choice. I got to get down here or else, I, you know, we don't have a chance here. So I landed this little, you know, light plane on the strip. It's a 600 foot strip, really bad new strip. And they start firing us, you know, I'm, I'm landing and stuff like that. I roll it out, twist it around. And they hit, they send a, a sergeant in a Jeep out and he's a, he does a run and pick up of me and we go back to the bunker, the main command bunker. And we get in the command bunker, and he's and the captain who's in charge of this uh, A team. He points out to me on the map exactly where he uh, believes that all these positions are. You know where the artillery is firing from, and so on, and stuff like that. And points out through a, a, a little visual thing that they had to look outside. He points out you know the particular ridge lines that he believed. So now they because I, I landed there, they were. We were under a pretty good little garage there. They were firing on us pretty hit. So I said, okay, now i got to get back to my plane. So the captain looks at me and he says, you can't go out there. There's no way you can go out there. Okay? So I said, Captain, yeah, i got to get out there. So one of the sergeants over here says, I'll take you, sir. I'll take you. So the captain says, okay, sergeant. Take it. So the sergeant basically volunteered. So we get outside, we get in the Jeep, and the sergeant brings me back and drops me off as he's moving, and we got, you know, explosions going on. As we're going along, I get in the plane, and I'm moving right away, and, you know, I get back to the thing, and I take off, and as I take off, I don't have enough, a long enough strip to take off, but it's right on the edge of the cliff, so as I go off the end, 
I drop down on the cliff, get flying speed, come up and start circling around, come back up. Now I'm up high. I call for a fight. I call for a scramble to my control of all available fighter aircraft, all available F-100s, uh, to come in here with uh, bombs and strength and rockets that I've got, you know, an excellent target, and uh, we've got troops under uh, siege and so on and stuff, so forth. So the first fighters come in. They have I tell them to let down at uh, 40, uh, 342 degrees off the play coup tack hand at uh, 40 miles, let down and I'll pick them up. And down through the clouds I see this first flight of four F-100s coming. Meanwhile, because the guys show me where everything is, I see all the, the uh, foxholes and everything. This North Vietnamese unit, you know, there's a, a new guys or rookies or something, but they didn't come to their foxholes very well. So I can see their lines. I can see all their lines, okay? So they got these 50 caliber machine guns and you know artillery pieces and all that kind of stuff. So I bring down the F-100 site. I mark the, the first uh, uh, the, the first two uh, 50 calibers. They're always a pain in the neck. The heavy uh, machine guns. I mark them, and uh, the second bomb. I'm controlling the bomb. I say you know they can't see the fighters can't see this stuff. You got to you got to tell them on on the radio, you know, where to drop from the previous mark or the pre previous bomb and so on. The second bomb is right be between these two 50 caliber nests. And uh, I figured, well, I got down. But the very next fighter down gets uh, hit, okay, by those 50 calibers. So I said, well, screw that. You know, we're just not going to play games here. So let's go with straight. In other words, 20 millimeter cannon. We got a thousand rounds of uh, 20 millimeter cannon fire in each, uh, which are exploding warheads in each F-100. I tell them, listen, we're going to just start raking these, these uh, uh, foxhole lines, you know, these enemy lines. We're going to start raking them 20 millimeter back and forth. Meanwhile, another couple of flights of F-100s come down. I pick them up. I got them in orbit. And I say, just uh, watch what we're doing here. You're going to be doing the same thing. We're going to be hitting the same target over and over again. So to make a long story short, in the next two, two and a half hours, three hours, I put in 50 fighters on these communication lines, you know, just uh, these F-100s, they fire, they have four 1,500 rounds per minute rate of fire cannons. They, they fire 6,000 rounds a minute. That's 100 rounds a second. As they're coming in, they're firing that kind of uh, explosive warhead right down these trench lines. Trench line after trench line after trench line, over and over and over again. After a period of, you know, half an hour, an hour, there's nobody firing back. And we just keep going and going and going and going. My commander relieves me. I show him exactly where the thing is. He puts in another 50 fighters like that. and. Uh, the entire unit uh, breaks off. We received, our intelligence received a communication from them. They went back across the border into Laos. Uh, the communication to North Vietnam was that uh, they had to return to North Vietnam, that they no longer existed as a uh, uh, fighting unit. They'd lost all their officers, all their NCOs, and they just had uh, uh, a few men left. The uh, Special Forces team went up and patrolled in the area where these ridge lines were. They said they found mass grave after mass grave. Uh, they had arms and legs all over the trees, all over the ground. It was just chaos. Uh, you know, we really wiped out probably, you know, three, four, five hundred guys out of the six hundred men in the unit. So anyway, that was a, that was the first medal. The second medal was uh, a similar thing like that. It was a, a little village that got under attack. But I think I don't think you guys are uh, having to go home, don't you? Have to go home at eight thirty kind of thing. Tell one more story. Go ahead. Go tell one more story. Okay. Uh, the other the other time that happened, uh, this was, we had just got the docto. We we're in a special forces camp. Uh, one of these uh, patrols. Remember, I told you the patrols watched the trails. One of these patrols was by this village. There was one one village left in this valley. That's what we were brought up here. The North Vietnamese had overrun and killed all the villagers in about 20 or 30 villages in this valley. There was just one village left on this little road uh, river crossing 